Lamentations. That's in the Old Testament, right after the long book, Jeremiah. Lamentations. If you just got to a- FM, you're, you're hurting. I mean, if you got the whole Bible. Uh, some few years ago, one of the members of our church brought me this Bible. And it's a, it's a large print edition. I said to her, Clarine, you, th- you say I'm getting old? She said, oh, no, preacher, I'm not saying that. I said, well, I thank you anyway. I didn't use it much until recently. Now the large print's not large enough. I don't know what that says, but it says something. It says something you're getting old. But uh, uh, my ophthalmologist said a few weeks ago, he said, well, Jack, I can't help you much. My left eye has macular degeneration. If you know what that is, that's not good. But uh, he said, I can help you a little bit. He gave me a pair of glasses and they didn't help any. Betty was over there for a yearly exam. She said, uh, it didn't help Jack much. He said, tell him to come back. Well, I went back. I got another pair. Looks just like the other pair. But it's not helping much either. So our sweet secretary this week typed my outline in large print. I don't know if you ever noticed Billy Graham. Billy Graham had a notebook, eight and a half by 11, that he put on the pulpit. The reason was, of his eyesight for a long time. Billy Graham had trouble with his eyesight. So I'm thinking about getting me a big big notebook about that big, you know, and printing everything out. But uh, God's good, amen? Amen. I don't forget that. Look at Lamentations chapter one. You got that? Now look at verse 12. Verse 12, Lamentations chapter one. Look what Jeremiah says, who's the writer there. Is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of the fiery Anger, is it nothing to you? See, the prophet Jeremiah was a sad and solitary man of God in the midst of a corrupt and sinful nation uh, rushing on to judgment and to ruin. And his heart was broken by his wickedness of his generation, by his people. He uh, wished that his head were waters, his eyes were fountain of tears that he might uh, weep day and night for the daughter of his people. No doubt the other preachers of his day thought he was uh, some sort of a a nervous sort, uh, excited over the times that he wept like that. You know, most preachers I know never cry. My dad said to me when I first started preaching, i never forget this. It wasn't a compliment to me. It might have been to him, but it wasn't to me. He said, son, you'll never preach long if you keep crying. Well, that's okay. I don't want to preach long anyway. I, just, I want to preach short sermons anyway. If I have to cry, that's all right too. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. And uh, he seemed to Jeremiah that God was deaf to judgment. It's sure for judgment. He cried in the words of our text, is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you? See, folks, I think we're living in an hour today uh, and in the midst of a nation that bears all the characteristics of the nation of, of Jeremiah's time. In the midst of a world of confusion today we're living in, I think we would cry, of the indifferent passbyers, is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to the people of this country that America, without leadership, know little about what is wrong and even care less? As I hear the Congress talk and different people, millions drink and dance the way uh, at the modern feast of Belshazzar where our world's going to hell. Uh, 
the blind, trying to lead the blind, the Bible says they both fall into the ditch together. I think that's where we are. And then when we turn to the church today, the most humiliating scandal of all times is that still you and I must ask, is the church today, is it nothing, is it nothing to you? Brother Don was telling me a moment ago about yesterday and the problem that was up there. And I think about, you know, the churches. There's churches there who are supporting the flag they flew. We didn't fly that, thank God. But is it nothing to us that the church leaders today and the preachers of today, you know, this would... Actually, uh, probably Jeremiah's first question. In, the, in this modern day, preachers have gone to a social gospel, which indeed looks like the very thing for such an hour that we have. But it's really a, a substitution of preaching of rose water for repentance. We're not grieved, we're not concerned about the affliction of Joseph or Jerusalem or America. See, we, we need, I think what we really need to do today is to get down on our knees for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit of God and then stand in the gate and declare it's not well with this world. It's not well with this country. Prepare to meet thy God. See, I think ought we not to pray like the early church prayed? They prayed, Lord, once again, the rulers of earth are gathered against the Lord and Christ. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. I tell you, folks, we have very few preachers today that are bold enough to stand in the pulpits and declare the word of God. Now, we've got preachers. Our Lord promised to fill the overflowing those who thirsted for the living water of the Holy Spirit. But thirsting is something more than just wanting a drink of water. I don't think actually our day, our, our people, our churches, our pulpits are thirsting for the water of the Holy Spirit. We have a shallow desire for blessings today. There's not a, there's not, there's a reproach really and a thirst for souls who really prayed through to the mighty power of God. And in, in these days, like we did in other days, how many remember those days when people came to the altar and prayed and they wept over those in their country and their, their city and their county? We got more beer joints than we got churches. And we're having more and more every week, seems like. You know, I don't go to any of them, but... Uh, I understand that those who drink do. And you know, drinking won't send you to hell, but you might get under the wheel of a car and send somebody else to hell. But you know, folks, I, I, I'm sad. I was at, uh, Betty and I were at Walmart when we first moved back down here. And we run into this guy who used to come to church here. Pretty regular. And uh, he stood in front of, his, of the side of his buggy, kept trying, he, he was about this wide anyway, but he was trying to get this wide. He couldn't cover that whole buggy because there's more to drink in that buggy than he wanted me to see. And I'm not going to ask anybody. My son said, when you go to the store and you see a Methodist with booze, they'll speak to you. When you see a Baptist, they won't speak to you. I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, uh, he, wouldn't, he did speak. I didn't ask him who's going to drink that. I know it wasn't his wife. You know, but folks, it's amazing what's happening in this city. We've not had a preacher in this city who had enough courage to say anything to the paper or to the press or to the mayor or the city council to stand up for what's right for God since Ramsey Pollard went to Memphis many years ago. There was a day that went, uh, some years ago when some of us preachers hung the paper in effigy <laughs> on Gay Street and uh, I've not seen preachers stand up for anything lately. Have you? Uh, you mean? 
I'm not confused, I hope. But is it nothing to the professing Christians today? You know, when, when dance, halls, dance halls are uh, filled and crowded to the doors and church members sit at home on Wednesday night prayer meeting and with their faces buried in the newspaper or bowed down to the magic box, a great awakening has not come. Our pastor, now I don't get to be here every week, but if I'm not preaching somewhere, I'm here. He's a great Bible teacher. And you miss on Wednesday night, you miss out on some good things. Anthony's done the last two weeks and they're both good. And uh, I enjoyed them. And you would too. If you had enough courage to get up off your couch and get over here at the, at the church time. But you know, while the devil packs the aisles of our movie theaters and places of sin, ministers stand in near empty churches and preach their hearts out across this city. Church members sit in the movies and cry over the glistening tears of some divorced actress or, or yell themselves hoarse at a football game. And, but on Sunday, where are they? They're not in the house of God. Now, I love football. You know that. I help coach football and basketball. There's nothing I enjoy better. But not on the Lord's day. It's a sad day, I'm going to tell you. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting off the subject. It's a sad day when the UT and some of our high schools started playing ball on Sunday. It's a sad day when our uh, Knox County Recreation League let our young men play on Sunday. And yet parents across our city said nothing. Some years ago, it's been a while, Pop Hamilton over at Central told his choir, we're going to go over to the Hyde House on Sunday afternoon and sing. It's getting close to Christmas. Well, some, some of the kids here told me about it. I called Earl Hoffmaster. Earl was superintendent of school. I said, Earl, that's not right. Pop Hamilton's got our kids six days. We don't need them to take them on Sunday. We're trying to have youth on Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. We don't need that. He said, I'll take care of it. Well, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> they didn't go. My, the kids of our church got mad at me. I, you know, I'm just sticking up for what God wants us to do. I, I just want to be a preacher who has courage. And I want you to be members who have courage. I saw football coach and our boys were playing. They won't be there on Wednesday night. They won't be there on Sunday. Do you have parents that have that much courage today? Folks, our nation's going to hell in a basket and we're silent before God. You know, fields are white on the harvest, but the labors are few. You know, uh, it might be confusing to you for a few minutes, but I believe it'd be worth it if we gave all of our committees a rest and they took a vacation and even missed a few Sunday services while the people and the preacher caught their breath, got on their knees before God and prayed rather than going to service. Oh, you say, I thought we were supposed to be. Here you are. <laughs> a lot of people didn't hear me this morning. But you know, uh, we need to pray down a fresh Pentecost. The only way that we're gonna have a Pentecost meeting in our churches is for God's people to come to the place that they know prayer is more important than going to a ball game. Prayer is more important than going to the movie. Prayer is more important than what we do on Sunday besides pray. You know, I think we've sunk into a rut and we've sunk into a routine. There's no divine urgency on the part of church people today. Uh, we don't care about the sinfulness of our times. We don't care about the poverty of our own souls. We're not burdened with a real need. Is it nothing to us as a church? Is it nothing to us? The world's going to hell? I want to ask you a question. 
How many people this year have you invited to the house of God? How many, do, do you know any of your neighbors? Do you know where they go to church or not? My wife knows every, all 60 houses in our subdivision. She knows everybody's name. If she hadn't forgot them, we've invited everybody. Matter of fact, yesterday we walked up the street to a new family. Gave us some information about our church. There was a day when I walked every street in this vicinity. Matter of fact, I didn't miss a house. There's a house I won't point out to you now, but anyway. Uh, Donna Stevens, most of you remember Donna, who's gone on to glory. When she decided she'd walk up and down the street and visit people. And she went to this one house, not very far from here, maybe a little over a stone's throw, but the wife had passed away and she was talking to the husband on the porch. He said, well, there's one preacher over there that used to come over here and nobody comes anymore. They're, they're of another denomination. They don't want anybody, to be honest. He said, but he made my wife mad and she wouldn't come over there. Listen, I've got convictions, folks. I don't care whether you like it or not. I've got convictions. I know what's right, what's wrong. And, you know, if you're not where you ought to be, that's, then I've got convictions about that. And so we, we talked a little bit about the church where she belonged. She got mad at me. That's okay. Uh, she's gone on to face God about that, and I'm, I'm willing to do the same thing. Is it nothing to you who are unsaved, never been born again, never been saved? Is it nothing to you that, that you live in a closing days of this age? That the wrath of God abides on you? Do you know that? Does it not matter that Christ died for you? There gave his life a ransom for you. And Anthony talks about this on Wednesday night, the cross of Christ. Not only is there no sense of crises in our country and in our church, there, there's no sense of emergency, no sense of crises among people who are unsaved, who've never known Jesus as their Savior, because men have lost consciousness of the awfulness of sin and the certainty of judgment and the terror of hell. You know, hell is real. Do you know that? How many believe that? Say amen. I believe that. I believe hell's real. I believe when you die without Jesus, you go to hell. That's not a very delightful subject, but it's true. Preachers don't preach about hell today. Some time ago in the church where I was an interim pastor, I preached on hell one Sunday. And a man came to me and he said, I appreciate you preaching on hell. I haven't heard a sermon on hell in a long time. I said, if you come next Sunday, you may hear it again, because hell's real. People without Jesus go to hell. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? I don't care if it's your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. If they die without Jesus, they go to hell. It's not easy to stand before people and say your mother, your dad went to hell. I've never done that. I've wanted to a lot of times. Matter of fact, some years ago, not too many years ago, there was, a, there was a man in our church, his, he and his wife, his, the man, his dad, passed away. I'd been to see him, and he wasn't a Christian, didn't know the Lord. But when he died, they asked me to do the funeral. Now, you know, I've never got up before a congregation and said, well, here's, here's Mr. So-and-so. He died, and he's a great and good man, and, and, and he, he's gone to be with the Lord. That's not, if that's not the truth, that's a lie. So if you ask me to preach the funeral and, and you're not saved, I'm not going to say you went to heaven. So I didn't say anything about the man, negative or positive. My senior adult pastor who had been to see him a number of times didn't say anything negative or positive. And so I, never did, I didn't see him for a while. I went by the house and they didn't say anything. They didn't come back to church. They left the church. Why? Because the pastor and the associate pastor 
didn't say that their daddy was a Christian. But dear friend, I'm going to tell you, if you don't go to church, if your religion won't take you to church, it won't take you to heaven. Mark it down. I said it. I don't take it back. I believe that. I believe the Bible teaches us to be in the house of God on the Lord's day. Amen? Amen. Come on. Where are you? Okay. Let me remind you that in the midst of our problems in this nation, nationally and in the problems of the church, and the individual problems stands Christ Jesus saying, He will not come to me that you might have life. The greater question is not is this nothing to you, but is he nothing to you? The answer is a sin question. Is the son question. Are you listening? Say, I'm listening. I'm listening. I had a deacon at Unique Avenue, and uh, he'd sit right over here on, uh, on the, that third row. And every, t- every once in a while, I'd say, are you listening? He said, you know, preacher, that's okay. But he said, about the time I doze off to sleep, you say, are you listening? It wakes me up. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but is he nothing to you? The answer to the sin question is a son question. He's the answer to every problem this nation has. He's the solution to every problem that every situation that you and I have. God awakened this nation. The church and the lost to the call of the ancient prophet Jeremiah is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Is it nothing to you, nothing to me? that the world's going to hell, that your friends are lost, your family's lost, individuals are lost, going out to meet God unprepared. I have something I want to read to you. You know, we used to sing a song. Our trio used to sing, and Dottie's here. Uh, The other two have gone on to glory. I remember going to see Juanita Fish when she's in, in the nursing home. And she said to me that day, now preacher, if you're going to pray for me to get well, don't do it. I said, oh. She said, I'm going to a place where you never grow old. A place where, you know, there's no sickness, no sadness. You like to go to nursing homes? Here's one preacher that hates to go to nursing homes. I mean, I go when I pastor it, but I hate it. One of the reasons why I hate it is my mom was there six and a half years. To, uh, down here off Middlebrook Pike. I told my, my wife, every time I'd go in there and come out, I'd be so unhappy. And it got to where I just couldn't hardly stand it. But I've had so many members who've been in nursing homes those last few years. It's so difficult to minister to them when they can't respond but you know, here's, here's something that a missionary wrote from Africa, a pastor in Africa, in the midst of severe persecution. I told you about our missionaries. I wish I could take you to some of those places. Betty and I were in Vietnam. We went to uh, places that had an incurable disease, had leprosy. And in that in that place. Once you go in, you never come out. Your family, if they go to see you, they can't come out. It was crowded. There was young people there and there was old people there. We tried to witness uh, our missionary witness to them. A lot of people have the lepers, they have the sickness of sin that never, there's no cure except through Jesus. This pastor wrote this, and I want to read it to you because you need to hear it. Now don't Don't turn me off, okay? I need to read it. It says, I'm part of a fellowship of unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision's been made. I'm a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up, slow up, back up, or shut up. The past is redeemed. The present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tan visions, 
worthy falling, clearly giving, and dwarfed gold. I'm no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, and popularity. I don't have to be right, first, top, recognized, praised, regarded, and rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk with patience, and uplifted by prayer, and labor with prayer. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guides reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up and stored up and prayed up and paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till I all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My banner is clear. We need to have that as our motto and be a member of the fellowship of unashamed, unashamed of Jesus, unashamed to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. I thank God for Don. He goes till he drops. He goes to different places, he goes to different prisons, witnesses, here at home, not just that way, but at home. Stands his ground does what the Lord's called him to do. And he's called all of us to do the same thing. None of us, including me, have much of an excuse today. We just use things for excuses. You know and I know that there's really no excuse for all of us. I don't walk very well, don't breathe very well. Sometimes I wonder if I'm gonna breathe my last breath, that'll be okay. I don't worry about that. Do you worry about that? I go to sleep at night, and if I don't wake up in the morning, that's okay. That'll be good. Be better off than what it is. And you will be too if you know Jesus. If you don't know him, you're not living for him, you're not serving him, it won't be good. I will face God at the last day and stand before him ashamed. Must I go on empty-handed? Must I to the Savior go? Not one so with which to greet him must I empty handed go. Lady came to me this morning and she said, thank you for leading me to Jesus. What, how it thrills my soul. Betty and I was at a pastor's meeting some time ago and Adrian Rogers' wife was a speaker. During that break period, I want to tell you this, and I'm close. A lady came to me and she said, can I talk to you, preacher? I said, Absolutely. And so I, I looked her in the face and I saw her chin begin to quiver. In a few minutes, tears began to run down her face. She was a pastor's wife in this area. Tears began to run down her face. She said, I want to thank you for leading me to Jesus. You know, I wanted to shout. I was afraid to in front of all them people. But <laughs> I want to say, glory. Yeah. I didn't. I wanted to. It would embarrass her. And I was glad she was a deacon's daughter. I had the privilege of leading her to the Lord. Have you even talked to anybody? Have you witnessed anybody? Have you taken what God's given you and shared it with anybody? Sure, our house is full. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Not packed full. Not packed jam, but not another seat in the house. That's not true. But we have a lot of people. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. 
but there's no one out in the field. My house is full, my fields are empty. Who'll go and work for me today? Who'll go and share Christ for me today? That's what the Lord's saying to all of us. All of us. Who's going to witness for me? While we sit comfortably in our pews and the world goes to hell. It's good to sing. Dale does a great job leading our music. The choir does a great job leading our music. And folks, that's not the end. That's only the beginning. Our pastor's a good preacher. I think. I think I'm right. You can be wrong if you want to. But anyway, I, I, you know, it, that's not his job. That's not Don's job to witness to everybody. I don't know how many times I've heard the pastor say they came to my office. Why? Why did they come to the office? Because some of us didn't go to their home. Most people that are led to Jesus, are led to Jesus by somebody like you and me who care enough to go with them and visit with them and take your Bible and tell them about Jesus. But we don't do that. I hear people say, you know, we can't visit no more. Tell the Jehovah Witness that. Tell, tell, them, tell the Mormons that. They can't visit no more. I was in a revival up in Canada and the pastor wanted me to share with the people our visitation here. So I did. Betty and I, we shared with them the visitation program we had and how it was received. And so after, after the service, I said to them, how many will meet me here, meet Betty and me here after lunch and go visit? <laughs> and you, I'll have to tell you, we didn't, we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to beat them off with a stick. Nobody came. The lady who we were staying with right across the street we went over there to eat a bite and she said, Preacher, we don't do that here. I said, why not? We don't visit people here. Why not? I want to tell you folks, we can have every excuse in the world, but the truth is we don't love the Lord enough. Now, you don't have to holler amen, that's all right. But it's true, we don't care. We've, we've come to the place and we think you can't do it. You can do it. Every visitor that comes here is a prospect for somebody to go see. Todd shouldn't have to do that, all of it. Oh, he does, uh, he does his part. Thank God for that. But it's also our responsibility to help and do what God's called us to do. Call, call us to be fishers of men, not fishers of fish, but fishers of men. And you and I have that responsibility. Whether you like it or not, it's yours. God's given it to you. We're fishers of men. Follow me, Jesus said, I will make you to become what? Fishers of men, not fishers of fish. I like to fish, but that wasn't why the Lord saved me. I think it's our responsibility to witness to people. All God's people said, oh me. But that's our responsibility. How many people do you know if you stand before God at the end of your life, well, who will be there and say, I know you. You led me to Jesus. You came to my house. I was lost. And you came and you told me how to be saved. How many? Must I go and empty handed? Must I to my Savior go? Not one soul with which to greet him? Must I empty handed go? When we left Sunnyside, I guess I'm glad we left, but anyway, we had a hundred people signed up to go with faith on Monday night. Now, I don't know, it's not 100% good. There are some people who will sign up that won't go come. But it's our responsibility to do it. Our responsibility to go. Not send somebody else. Hear my Lord, send Don. Hear my Lord, send Sam. Hear my Lord, send John. Hear my Lord, send the preacher. 
Hear my Lord, send me. Send me. Pray with me. Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for being here. Let's pray together, would you please? Dale's going to come and lead us to the hymn of invitation. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, and I know it's not the same thing. I know it's not the same thing. I know it's different. That's okay. You'll, you'll forgive me for this, please. I want us to come to this altar. All of us who are saved and know Jesus and say to our Lord, Lord, give me the grace, give me the courage, give me the ability to witness to someone before I go home to be with you. I want to be a witness. I want to be a soul winner. I want somebody to stand before a holy God someday and say, you led me to Jesus. You gave me the plan of salvation and I thank you. I want that to happen to me. Time after time, day after day comes and goes. And we don't take the opportunity to even invite anybody to the house of God. Let's stop that. I want you to come to this altar tonight. Now, nobody will know what you're praying, but you and God. And just say, Lord, I'm sorry the preachers preached to me tonight, but thank you anyway. I want to be a soul winner. I want you to give me the grace. I want you to give me the courage to witness to somebody before it's too late. It may be your family, it may be your friends, it may be a schoolmate, it may be somebody that you know, it may be somebody that you don't know. But Lord, give me the courage to be a witness for you. When Dale begins to sing in a minute, I want you to get up out of your seat and come and stand here with me. And let's make that commitment to the Lord. Will you do that? Okay. Father, speak to our hearts. May we be an obedient people. This world is sad. This world is going to hell. People are going to hell from our neighborhood and from our, our associates and our friends without Jesus. Give us the courage, please. Give us the grace that when our paths cross, intentionally or unintentionally, we'll have the courage to share Christ with them before it's too late. In Jesus' name.